Okay, let's begin our webinar today. So welcome everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on wherever you are. Uh, so today, uh, this Tuesday, we have uh, Latonia with us. Uh, she's going to be our guest speaker. So Latonia Wilkins uh, is, is our guest speaker for today. And uh, she is going to present uh, this webinar around how to build a real relationship with people who are different from us uh, when we are coaching people. Uh, you know, how to go about building the psychological safe space uh, for the people who are literally different from us in terms of culture, background, and all that kind of stuff. So um, this session is going to be an interactive session and we will be focusing on the human side of coaching. Uh, and what we all will learn today is uh, that how our implicit bias and our blind spots interfere with us when we go about building the most trustful coaching relationships with our clients, which are like different from us. Uh, besides this, uh, we'll also, so we'll, we'll also learn that by coaching people is but who are different from us is a vital skill that we all need to possess this as coaches. Uh, and what are the common missteps that as humans we take when we interact with people which are, who are different from ourselves and how to recognize this and how to avoid those missteps. And uh, Latonia and her team, uh, so they work with professionals, executives globally uh, and they create the culture of belonging, the, the culture which is motivating enough for people to thrive and amplify the only ones at work so they feel more valued, heard, and engaged at work. Uh, Latonia has worked with leaders across the major uh, Google giants like Google, GE, SurveyMonkey, New York, and so many other nonprofit organizations. Uh, she has built her career working in HR, talent management, and learning and development at Fortune 500 companies before teaching and taking on progressive leadership role at the University of Illinois, G's College of Business. So Latonia was rated an excellent teacher by her undergraduate business students. And she's also a board member of the LGBTQ community plus alumni association at Indiana University. So we have the honor and pleasure of uh, being with, uh, spending another one hour with Latonia. Uh, so over to you, Latonia, and uh, welcome once again. Oh, thank you, Ritu, for that, that introduction. So hi, yeah, sure. everyone, I'm Latonia, and I am a very interactive speaker. So if you could uh, turn your videos on, if you feel comfortable, I would greatly appreciate that because I'm gonna be asking a lot of questions. We're gonna be interacting quite a bit. And first thing I want to do is I, I know there are many, I see some familiar faces, there's some familiar names out there. So if everyone could put your name and where you are joining from in the chat, that would be great to so put your name and where you're joining from in the chat. And so I'm going to jump right into this. So I have some slides I'm going to share, but usually when I present, I kind of alternate between slides and talking here on screen. So I'm gonna start with some slides and then we're gonna dive into some polls. A little bit about how this is gonna work is I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on why coaching people that who are different from you is the most important skill in business right now for coaches. And then I'm gonna get into the coaching below the surface model in the last few minutes. I'm gonna give you a taste of, a little taste of what that looks like. This is all based in my book, uh, Leading Below the Surface. So I don't know if uh, Ritu, if I'm on screen, but we could change that. Okay, so I'm gonna share a few slides here. And so I'm gonna start off and, and tell you a little bit of a story. So this picture you see here on the screen, um, you'll see that there's several women here uh, and you'll see that these, there's several working women here. And in the middle here, you, you may, it's hard to see her, uh, that's my grandmother, okay? This picture was taken in the 1970s in the US. And 
the reason why I show this picture is because there's a story behind it. So uh, when my grandma, it, she, she lived to be about 93 years old, and she'd often tell me the story about her coworkers, and these were her coworkers. And she was often, she was the only one at work for many decades. And what's, what's really uh, inspiring about this story is um, my grandma was the only one at work. She actually fled the South, the Southern US uh, to be in the Northern US due to uh, Jim Crow laws and other laws against people of color. And my mother didn't want to abide by those laws. So my grandma moved North and then she ended up with these folks. And what's really inspiring about this is that, uh, again, this was taken in like the 1960s and 70s. And these women worked together for about 50 years and they became really good friends. Um, when, when we had my grandma's homegoing celebration, um, some of their children were there, some of their grandchildren were there. Um, these people, these women would call them every day. And um, my grandma uh, pseudo adopted some of their children because she lived, outlived a lot of her coworkers. Why am I telling you this? Well, because building relationships with people who are different from you has been something that I've always been accustomed to doing. Uh, you know, in the environments I grew up, I've always been inspired by others in my family who did it well. My father was also one who did it well. And so I went through life just questioning, why, why is this so hard for us? Like, why do we, why do we marginalize people? Why do we, why do we have core people that run organizations and leave others out? And so this is what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, coaching below the surface and how do we build real relationships with people who are different from us? How do we lead below the surface like my grandma did and taught me to do in my life? So here's my commitment to you. So these are my five character strengths. If you haven't taken the character strengths assessment, I'll, I'll, I'll provide a link in the, in the show notes. But it's, uh, I definitely think everyone should do it. There's so many assessments out there and most of them are related to business related skills and business related skills only. But mine are perspective wisdom. So you're gonna hear some of that today. Again, I'm gonna be sharing a lot of stories and, and passing on some of the wisdom that I've learned uh, through others in my own life. I'm, curi I'm curious and interest interested in the world. So you're gonna see that I come at things from a place of curiosity. And so as we go through this, you're gonna, you're gonna see that that's my style as I talk about some, some things in the workplace that are sometimes really hard to talk about. Uh, I'm creative um, and I have originality. And so I, I try to find uh, creative ways to solve our biggest challenges in, in the world. Appreciation of beauty and excellence. So one of the things, if one of you says something in an eloquent way, I'm gonna remember that. And I'm going to, 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 uh, to, to re-say that again and uh, reinstate what, what you said to the audience. And then a gratitude. I have so much gratitude that all of you are here today. And I, I don't say that with a grain of salt. I, I, don't, I take this very seriously. And I think that uh, it's, it, we all have to be grateful for each other as we learn about things like this. And we have to be grateful for each other as we make progress on things like this. So here are my commitments. And if you have some commitments that you wanna bring into the, the session, go ahead and type those in the chat as well. All right, so now we're gonna do a couple of polls. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here for a minute. And so the first poll is, I'd love to hear about why you are here today. So if you could go ahead and answer that poll. So do you attend almost anything related to this topic? Are you currently working with diverse clients? Uh, are you just curious or are you here for other reasons? And if you're here for other reasons, please put those in the chat. Okay, we got most people answering this. So, I want to share this with you, and then I have one more poll next. So it looks like most of you are, are curious. You're just curious about this topic. Uh, some of you are working with diverse clients. So here, here is how this shook out. Some of you just attend any, almost anything related to diversity and inclusion. So here's how this shook out. So I'm gonna, there's going to be something for everyone today. So I have one more poll, and this is 
Let me see if I can do this here. All right. Me too. I can't. Oh, here it is. There it is. Okay, here we go. Second poll. And can everybody see me on the screen? Because we too, I can't see myself on the screen. So I don't know. Um, no, I can see you. Okay. Go there. Yeah. Okay. Here's the second poll. So I want to know what backgrounds people come from. I would love to know if you are a full-time coach, are you a part-time coach, or are you a practitioner? So let's kind of go into this and we could talk a little bit more around this. All right, so we have majority coaches, and then we also have some practitioners. So it, it seems like, it looks like most of you are full-time coaches. All right, so this is how the audience, this is how everybody shakes out today. All right, so we are going to have a conversation. This helps me kind of shape how I cover things, which stories I tell, and what I emphasize. All right, so now we're gonna go back into so this is our agenda for today. So I coaching people who are different from us and connecting with people who are different from us, I see it as the number one skill that coaches need to prepare for the future. And I'm gonna give you some data on why I believe that. Then I'm gonna talk about some common mishaps uh, that, that occur when coaching people that are different from us. Then I'm going to go into, I'm gonna end with a little bit of a taste into coaching people who are different from you. Again, this is a excerpt from the model from my book, Leading Below the Surface. So why is coaching below the surface such an important skill for us? Well, first off, the workplace is getting much more diverse. And even though the workplace is getting much more diverse, it doesn't mean we're getting more inclusive. Yes, there has been, people say to me a lot, and people have said this a lot to me, especially in the last week, we're getting better around the world. Um, yeah, we're getting more awareness, but the long-term inclusion is still not occurring. And, and you could see from this McKinsey study that was done uh, just recently, you'll see the challenges that each, that each uh, group is having in the workplace. And you'll see that here on the top, all these groups are, are groups that are often othered in the workplace. They're groups that are often not prioritized in the workplace. So for example, with mental health is an issue that is, is happening in the workplace, disproportionately it's happening for women, okay? Especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Growth and progress opportunities. It's a challenge for everyone, but especially for LGBTQ plus employees. Child and child care and family care. Parents are, are taking uh, the brunt of this. I see it every day where it's, it's really hard to to balance the childcare, especially with children being out of school. And then LGBTQ plus are also, again, connectivity and belonging has been an issue, but especially the highest group that's having issues with that is LGBTQ plus. So what I'm, what I'm trying to show you is that we, we're saying, oh yeah, yeah, we're getting better, we're getting better. Uh, I don't know. I mean, and also there's still a lot of first happening. Like we're hearing a lot of first time women leaders. We're hearing a lot of, of, of like first time LGBTQ leaders. Yeah, I think we're gaining some awareness around that. And I do want to celebrate that. But I, I, like I said, I am, I am skeptical still because there's still a lot of groups that don't belong. This is why I believe that coaching below the surface is one of the most critical skills at work. So this, this list is, is from the World Economic Forum. And it's all the world, it's like the biggest world problems that we're having right now or that we're facing right now. And if you look at this list, uh, you're probably thinking, wow, this is, this is overwhelming. But the big thing here, if you look at this list is as coaches, we can have a big impact on the future, right? Um, a lot of these issues here, if you are coaching people who are different from you, if you are coaching people who are different from you effectively, a lot of these skills, a lot of these things can be overcome. Also, if you are leading below the surface, again, you are building real relationships with people who are different from you. All of this, this, all of these things can be overcome. I'm convinced that a lot of these problems that we have are because we don't do this well. Um, we're not getting the right people at the table, right? Um, you'll see a lot on here around people just not feeling included. You'll see disability inclusion. 
you'll see mental health crises. Again, if we are, uh, if we create a sense of belonging around the world for people who are different from us, imagine what we can do. If we are empowering people, imagine what we could do. And so this is, again, the number one skill that I see is coaching below the surface and, and making sure that we are building real relationships with people who are different from them, from us and bringing new things to the table. So why is this important? Well, let's talk a little bit about this on a micro level. So, you know, I've done many of these, these conversations with coaches and there's a lot of misperceptions around why this might not be as important for coaches, right? We go through extensive training. We go through extensive training on, on how to coach people. We go through extensive training on how to listen. And so the, the biggest pushback I get, that, or the biggest misperception that I hear is that, hey, I'm a coach and I ask powerful questions. So I naturally create a sense of belonging. Mm, no, that's not true. Um, I've had coaches and my clients have coaches who were different from them. And this is not the case. You know, if you're, I only coach, you know, maybe uh, Ritu only coaches women. So this isn't really important, right? It is important, <laughs> again, because it, we, if we want to work together across the world to solve the biggest business problems of the future, we have to coach people who are different from us. It's going to be the default. The world is diverse. Um, look at this room. This is, we have a diverse world. We are going to need to coach people who are different from us. The third one I, I always, I often see is a client as a client. You know, I'm colorblind. I see everyone the same. Ah, that theory doesn't work. And we're going to talk more about that. Um, again, I call that the, the colorblind uh, misperception. You have to see people for who they are, right? Um, I, yeah, there is a little bit of risk there because there's going to be some bias there. And we're going to talk a little bit about that but you, you do have to see people for who they are when they walk in the room. And I'm gonna hear from you in a couple minutes on how you do that. Another misperception that we have is that we often overestimate how inclusive we are. And so I, I usually show this diagram because this is based on a study that was done within, uh, I think it was Harvard Business School and the Center for Talent in partnership with the Center for Talent Innovation. And when you look at this, there's a chart over here on the right. It's a small chart. You'll see that more, way more people consider themselves allies than are actually active allies. So I'll translate this diagram a little bit for you or this chart a little bit for you. So out of all, everyone that was surveyed in this study, 83% of women and 70% of men have considered themselves allies. But when it came down to them and completing this questionnaire, well, according to this questionnaire, only 19% of those, those women and 8% of those men were active allies. So here I have a curve and most people who, who are kind of on that allyship continuum and allies are people who stick their neck out for people who are different from, for, from them. They, they actually, they um, go out of their way to create equity in the workplace. I talk about this a lot in my book because uh, it, it's in the real leadership model around equitable. So a lot of people are more friends and supporters. Like they might listen to you, they might, they might let you vent, but they're really not sticking their neck out. And I, but, they, but the issue is here is that we think we're sticking our neck out, but the truth is, is that we're not. So I would like to get a little bit of a glimpse into your practices. So if you could put in the chat, and it, it doesn't have to be a, an exact number, you can do it a percent, but how many clients have you coached that were different from you in the last year or so? And these can be clients that could be a different race, could be a different gender, could be a different sexual orientation, but anything that's different from you, like how many, would you, would you estimate that that's 20% of your business? Would you estimate that that's 50% of your business? If you could go ahead and put your answer to that question in chat. So again, how many folks have you coached or what percentage of your business is people different from you? And again, you could do percents. And I know diversity is going to be defined differently for all of us because we're around the world. But any, if, however you consider diversity, Branda, that's great, 80%, I love that. Uh, we've got some 20s, we've got some 25s. Keep adding those 
And you're going to see that most people are going to hover around probably 25 to 30%. Um, we'll get some 80s and some 90s, but we're going to, most coaches that do this are probably in the 25, 30%. And keep putting that in there. And as you're, as you're typing your numbers, I want you to think about the implications of that, right? Like if you only are coaching 20% of people who are different from you, what does that mean for your practice? And what, what types of uh, personal development do you, wanna, do you wanna participate in? So, so you can get better at that. Uh, I think it's a skill of practice, right? And exposure. And so having more of that will, will help as well. So again, this matters because as business coaches, our clients often pick us, right? We might be hired by a company or be on a company's coaching list, but clients really, they, they pick us. And that, that, um, that process can be filled with bias and questioning on both sides. And so, you know, my first coach, for example, uh, was a terrible coach with inclusion. And um, he didn't really listen to me. He didn't really, um, he hit a lot of biases towards me and in who I was. And so this really matters. And because what happens is once you have a bad experience or if you're having a, a challenging experience in your organization, this is what really happens when a client, for example, this is a, this is a client, let's call her uh, Tamika. You know, Tamika is, there's a, these are my everyday clients. Like Tamika is the only one at work uh, her boss wants to hire a coach for her, and she, we're curious about who, who to hire. And the boss finally says, okay, here's a list of three coaches. You pick, Tamika picks the coach. And even though the coach seems like it, it might, they might be a good fit, there's still a turn in Tamika's head. Uh, some of the things she's thinking about is, you know, will this person understand me? You know, are they really going to understand? Are they going to have empathy for me? You know, is this the right coach for me? I, you know, I'm not really sure if this is the right person. You know, has this person coached people like me before? And some of you, again, you may say, well, that's not really important. It is. It's very important. And, and again, it may not be important to you, but your clients are thinking about it. Can I trust this person? Is this person really, is, is this coach going to go back to my boss? Are they going to tell them everything that I, that I say? So this, again, this is the type of churn. Like when you are bringing on someone who is different from you as a client, these are the things that go through their head, right? Um, and then these may be things that people aren't asking, right? Uh, especially if, if they're hiring you as a coach through their organization. They may not ask you this, these questions because they may not have the psychological safety to do so. So I have another chat question. So I'd like to know about what you think about, what's your turn? So when you are bringing on a prospective client who is different from you, what is your initial reaction or what do you think about or what do you question? If you could drop your answer in chat. Again, when you have a new prospective client that is different from you, what is your initial reaction? And what do you think about? I mean, what, what are some of the things that are going through your head around this? So take a couple minutes and drop that in chat. Yeah, it could be life or coaching someone. It could be anything related to bringing someone on that's different from you. I know for me, I, I think a lot about um, like pronouns, what that person might wanna be called. And I, I ask some of these things up front. I also ask about, uh, you know, what are, what are their fears with having me as a coach, especially since I am different from them. So these are some of the things that I think about um, in, the, in the beginning. So no judgments, curiosity, yes. Curiosity is, is, a, is a good way to approach this. And um, yeah, a new challenge. Always accept want someone as they are. Yeah, how can you be curious, right? And, and again, I, even, I, I would say that 80% of my clients are executives and they're, they're white male executives. They're very different from me. And so it's, you know, I think about this. I do have to, like about 20% of coaching clients who are the only ones at work. And again, they might be different from me, um, but they are, they represent a group that's, that's often marginalized in the workplace. An opportunity to widen knowledge. Yeah, so these are things, I mean, I mean the, the point here is to think about it. Like, you know, it's sometimes we go into these situations 
and we're overconfident. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like, but we go into it thinking, oh yeah, we're coaches, we're fine. This is going to work, but that's not, that's not how this works. Right. And so I'm, I'm hoping I'm challenging you to give you a different way to think about this when you're bringing on clients who are different from you. So keep those coming in. So these are some common mishaps that we face when, when we are coaching people who are different from us or when we, we have that first contact or we're thinking about coaching people who are different from us. Sometimes we, we overcompensate, like we're, we, we're trying way too hard to make that person feel comfortable. And when you're doing that, it's like you're, you're saying, oh, I've coached people exactly like you before. I mean, yeah, you could say that on some level, but, but try not to say it in a way that, that feels tokenizing. Um, not allowing people to bring their entire selves to the coaching relationship. So, um, you know, one of the things, um, you know, Marsha Reynolds, I, who I love, says a lot of, she talks about coaching the person and not the problem. And um, are you coaching the whole person or are you coaching the organizational problem? Are you allowing people to bring their entire selves to the coaching relationship? Another thing that we often see is avoidance. And you are, and that means glossing over things that make you uncomfortable about the person. And that avoidance usually, uh, that's unconscious. Like we'll, we'll jump to the things that, that feel familiar to us. And again, that, that's that affinity bias. Like we're looking for things that, that are similar to us in our own clients. So now I wanna shift to unconscious bias and how we've, how we've tried to address uh, diversity, equity, inclusion in, in, in coaching. And it hasn't worked. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to end with coaching below the surface. So I have a quick puzzle for you. And some of you may have seen this before. So I want you to read this very quickly and put your answer in chat. So a bat and a ball cost $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So go ahead and put your answer in chat. And again, don't overthink it. Just the answer that comes to your head, put it in chat. Again, a bat and a ball cost $1.10. The bat cost $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Okay, keep those coming in. Got some 10 cents, 5 cents. Okay. So for those that are still thinking about this, you're, you're probably thinking too long about it. So the correct answer is, is what Aisha, I think she got it right. So it's the one cost, the bat cost $1.05 and the ball costs five cents. So it's $1.05 and then five cents. What happens is most of us say 10 cents. I even said 10 cents when I first did this but that's the wrong answer. Um, and it, it's because of our unconscious bias that's, that's working, right? Um, you know, if you, if you take out a piece of paper and you do the problem now, now that you, you slow down, you, you'll see that when you access the rational part of your brain, that, that answer is gonna come to you. So this is how we go through the world, right? We, we go through the world and we, we have all these schemas in our head that help us process. We, we experience like millions and millions of bits of information. So our brain is always trying to organize that information effectively. And so, like I said, a lot of organizations are doing this unconscious bias training in order to kind of remedy some of these biases. So I'm gonna share a final poll and so, which of these are true? Like I said, a lot of organizations are doing uh, more and more work around unconscious bias training, diversity training. I'm sure many of you have been through some sort of diversity training module. So which, are, which of these are true about diversity training? It, is, it has been associated with overconfidence. It's a highly effective uh, tactic to use for diversity inclusion efforts. Um, requiring it is a good organizational uh, strategy and that's going to be mandatory diversity and inclusion. And then the fourth is none of the above. So I'm gonna give all of you a chance to, to do this, this final poll.
and I keep those coming in. Okay, so it the answer is so let's first see how folks. Most of you picked um, it has been it, requiring it as a good organizational strategy. Yeah, you know, I kind of tricked you here. You, you know, requiring it with other things is a good organizational strategy, but surprisingly, the answer is A. So let me talk a little bit more about this. So what, what's been found is that when people go through organizational diversity training, they they experience overconfidence, which means that they're checking a box and they're saying, oh, I already did this training, so I'm good at this. I'm good. This is area is done. And so that's that that was based on a, a um, Harvard Business Review study that you know managers they, they get overconfident after this. Why is this important? Um, well, let's first talk about what implicit bias is. I, we, I kind of I gave you a, a quick problem so you could see and get a glimpse into it. The stereotypes, it's, it's our brain trying to make sense of the world very quickly. These, these uh, biases can be favorable or unfavorable. They're involuntary. There's a ton of them. Um, one could be that um, all Asians are smart, for example, could be an implicit bias. So when you're interviewing Asians, maybe you tend to, to bring them into your engineering department more. So that's, that's an example of an implicit bias. They're not always bad on the surface, even though I would say that that, that type of bias is, is also not, not, not um, good for the workplace. So the, the research says that this doesn't work. So there was a um, meta-analysis by Forscher uh, from the University of Michigan. And um, what he did is, is he looked at dozens of implicit bias trainings and he measured the effect, efficacy of them. And what he found is that um, it doesn't work. It, in, in some cases, it makes people even more biased. And this is more of like a reaction for, it's like an aggressive reaction for having to participate in this on a mandatory basis. So what he also found is that exposure, so exposure to different types of people, having a diverse community around reduces our biases, not training. So it, it's one of the things, and this is an older psychological theory as well. It says that if we are around diverse communities, we're, we're less likely to have um, implicit bias because we have representations uh, of, of diff our people who are different from us. It, representations of success, representations of, of, of different types of levels of work within people who are different from us. So for example, the people different from us aren't all in um, administrative positions. So, so what do we do? So this is, I know I, I put a lot of problems out there. So now I'm gonna get into the coaching piece. Like what do we, how do we coach people who are different from us? How do we coach below the surface? And so uh, my book, Leading Below the Surface, this is all based on that. The subtitle is, how to build real and psychologically safe relationships with people who are different from you. Amy Edmondson, who coined the term psychological safety, wrote my forward. I'm really excited about that. And the book is, uh, the reason why I asked her to write my forward is because the book is based on three different prongs of, of leadership in order to lead and coach people who are different from us. And here are the prongs. So the first prong is real leadership. So first, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Real leadership is an acronym. And so I'll talk a little bit about that model, which is based on uh, research. Empathy, so being able to uh, lead with empathy, coach with empathy first, and then psychological safety, which comes as a result of the first two. So what I'm challenging all of you to do today is get deeper with your clients. Okay, you're going to get deeper with your clients. And as you, the deeper and deeper you get, the more and more psychologically safe that someone feels. So uh, real leadership is the first piece. Again, you're, you're, this is where you're, you're first taking the dip in the water. Empathy is the second layer of depth. And I'm going to talk about that and what that looks like here in just a minute. 
And I'm going to give you some a, a framework that you can work with. I'm going to tell you about the two types of listening. And then psychological safety is what we achieve when we get really deep with our clients. So real leadership, what is real leadership? So first off, real leaders are relatable. So I, I talked to you a, a lot about how, how clients feel when they're coming in and they're different from you. What's the churn that goes through their head? What's the churn that goes to, through, through your head? And the, the big thing is that you wanna be relatable, right? You wanna be um, someone that kind of sits on the same stoop as your client, right? You wanna be someone that, um, you know, has relatable experiences for your clients. The second one is equitable. So you wanna create equity in your organizations. You wanna create equity in your coaching relationship. Uh, you wanna create, if you're a practitioner, you wanna create equity within your organizations. What do I mean by equity? Well, with equity, you always have an eye for structures and systems that, that may be marginalizing certain groups. You're always thinking about you know, access, like who has access to what? Um, you know, when you're thinking about equity in a coaching relationship and you're thinking about your client, does, does your client have equity within those organizations? And how can you create that equity? In the coaching community, how, how do we create equity? Who has equity? Who has access to, to most of the resources? So again, the, the second one is um, in, the, in the real acronym is equitable. The third is aware. And this is one that we, we often talk about. Uh, aware is being aware of who you are, what your shortcomings are, what your strengths are, and kind of focusing on that. That's why I shared my character strengths in the beginning, because I'm very aware of what kind of presenter I am. I'm very aware of how I interact with people, but always finding ways to improve that awareness by asking for feedback, by doing uh, different assessments, by having um, more informal conversations. And then the fourth one is loyal. And this one is so important for uh, psychological safety. And what I mean by loyal is that when, you're, when your employees make a mistake, you don't, you don't write them off. Or like for coaches, when your clients make a mistake, you don't write them off, okay? So you're really creating this sense of safety within real leadership as, as you are going through your coaching relationships and your organizational relationships. So first, real leadership. The second prong is empathy. And uh, in, the, in the picture on the left, I have a picture of me and my longtime coach, we're friends now. And the reason why I included her here is um, she really, she's very good with empathy, with being empathetic. Even when it's out, when, even when she was coaching me, she was empathetic, even when it was outside what our scope of the coaching relationship was supposed to be. And so in my book, I call this below the surface listening. And I talk about two different types of listening. I talk about person to person listening. So person to person listening, you are focused on the person. You don't have anything else, like any other distractions. You're playing things back. P2P listening is active listening to the person that's in the room and, and nobody else, no other distractions. P2B listening is another thing I talk about in my book that um, I would request all of you do as coaches because there's not enough of it in the world. And what that is, is person to belonging listening. And what that means is that we are looking around the room and making sure that folks belong. And if it's looking at a place, then we say something or we bring them in, right? What I, what I mean by that is, for example, if you're in a room of people or you're at an event and you see people are kind of sidelined and not they're not fitting in or people aren't talking to them, you're bringing them back in. And the only way you can do that is through listening and being an observer. So I'm asking that all of us observe more uh, when we're going through our days. I think a lot of us, like, you, you know, you, you're, you're so enthralled with your current people that you're talking to. Um, and sometimes, and I call that the core group, like we, we have these, these groups of people that are like our strong groups that we belong to. And sometimes we exclude to belong to those groups and we don't pay attention to other people around us. So again, the second prong is empathy and practicing person to person listening and person to belonging listening. The third prong is psychological safety. As many of you, as, as Ritu said when she introduced me, you know, I've taught classes 
uh, business schools, Geese College of Business. This is, this is a picture of my classroom. And the reason why I'm showing you this picture is, um, you know, I practice a lot of psychological safety in the classroom. And, and how do you do that, right? Because it, it's, it's hard to do. Well, first of all, you've got to do the real leadership first and then the empathy second. And then you move into psychological safety. What does that look like? Well, empathizing with others, you know, having confidence in yourself and your client relationships. Um, also, just, just being in others' shoes as much as possible. You know, a lot of times my students would bring things to me that weren't typical uh, student professor issues. And, um, you know, I had to create a space of psychological safety for them. I had to listen to them. And it was hard to do. But again, that goes back to the real leadership and the empathetic list listening. So a lot of times they didn't want me to solve their problems, right? They just wanted me to empathetically listen. Um, I also practiced person to belonging listening when I could look around my classroom and I could tell right away if someone wasn't fitting in or someone was having issues, right? And, and then I was able to, to kind of approach them in a coach-like way and say, is, is there something, you know, what can I help you with? Like, what can I, what, you know, what, what's going through your head right now in the classroom? So these are the types of things that create real psychological safety, which is definitely a rare thing to come by, right? In the, in the classroom, at work, um, in coaching relationships, all of those things. Yeah, and so, so sometimes we, I'm gonna end with this and take some questions. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in chat, but sometimes we dive into the deep end too quickly. And sometimes I think what we do is we try to dive straight into psychologically safe relationships. When first we we have to look inside, become a real leader, go it you know really build empathy and practice empathy with others who are different from us, and then we achieve that psychological safety. So again, these are the three prongs, and I and I talked a lot about I talked a lot today about and I'll sum up. And if you have any questions, you can put them in chat. So I talked a lot about why coaching and people who are different from us is the number one skill to solve our world problems. I talked about implicit bias in organizations and how they're addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how it's not working. And then I ended with um, some, some a glimpse from the, the coaching below the surface model. And here are the three prongs. So if you leave with nothing else, it, at least practice these three prongs, real leadership, empathy, psychological safety. So what will you do differently as a result of the session? So go ahead and, and type that in, your, in the chat and then we'll also take some questions. I'd love to stay in touch. So here's how you can get in touch with me. I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram, or my website. You can pre-order my book on my website. And that's all I have. So we could take questions. So Ritu, how do you wanna do questions? Yeah, so uh, we can take questions now. So uh, the participants with the audience who are there, uh, if you want to ask a question directly, uh, please feel free to raise hand. Uh, and of course, you can you can speak. Uh, otherwise, if you want to type the question in the chat, uh, yeah, you can do that. I think uh, we have one question here, Natonia. So the question is that what are the ways to balancing bringing participants into the conversation while respecting their learning cycle. For example, there are more quiet cultural differences in Trobot. Yeah, so I think, uh, thanks Sophia for that question. And, and if I'm not answering it, please, please let me know. You can take yourself off mute. But with things like that, with cultural differences and people different from me, I practice a lot of um, person to belonging listening. And again, what that means is that I'm looking around at the room, I'm observing them and different uh, situations to see if, if this is, maybe this is part of their personality or maybe there's something else that, that you need to be noting as a coach. So again, I, I would try to be an observer and uh, listen more than I talk and listen with more than one sense which is, you know, not just the sense of hearing, like listening also with your eyes. And so, so that's what I would do. I, and that's how I usually deal with that, uh, with, with cultural differences is again, the P2P listening and then P2B listening. Thank you, Latonia. 
And thank you, Sophie, for asking the question. So we have the next question from Ed Riggins. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, so her question is that any suggestions for avoiding overcompensation? Hey, Ed, how are you? I didn't see that you were here. It's good to see your name. Uh, so yeah, so Ed, I, I think, um, and you, you, would, you would know this well, um, one of the things that I, I do to avoid overcompensation is I always ask, even though it's a scary question to ask, before I enter into any relationship with a new coaching client, I ask, you know, what, what are your fears about, your biggest fears about me becoming your coach? And I let people answer that question. Or what makes you most uncomfortable with me becoming your coach? And everyone always has an answer, right? And sometimes it's not related to you. Sometimes it's related to them or, or something that, that they might have unresolved, but listening to that answer and probing on that. And so that way you can avoid any overcompensation by, overcompensation happens because we're, we're trying to prove to that person that we're good enough for them. But if you kind of put it on them and you let them voice their fears, then it's a really effective way to not do that. Thank you, Latonya. It's so beautifully answered. It's like the time we overcompensate is when we try to tell them that we are mm -hmm. good enough. Yeah. Thank you. So we have next question from Erica. It's what about when someone has very different values? How would you manage that relationship? Yeah, Erica, we've all been there and that's it's very hard. Um, and I, I think that um, with that, it depends on how that relationship was formed. So there's sometimes that happens when we're hired by an organization and we're coaching someone in that organization that we didn't pick, they might've picked us. And so in those situations, what I do is I try to scope it well. Um, and you know, as soon as I sense that they might have a value that is, that's a significant value, that's a clash with mine, then I'll, I'll try to, um, you know, scope it so we are focusing on the things that the organization hired you to do. Um, a lot of times, you know, the values can come into it, but many times they don't, they don't have to. Um, I think the other thing that I'll say, and this is, this is kind of a more radical thing, is every, all of us get to the point where we don't have to coach people that don't share values. And honestly, I don't anymore. I mean, I think if there are people that have diversity in values, like some somewhat divergent values from me, but if it's a direct values clash, you're probably not the right coach for them, for them and that's okay. Thank you, Donia, for answering that question. Uh, we have uh, not exactly question, but we have Vina Vina, and she's asking if you have any, if you could share some tips on working on avoidance uh, slash glossing over. Yeah, so this one is, uh, this one is hard. So I talk about in my book, I talk about a process called bridging. And with bridging, with every vulnerable action you take, you're building another slat on the bridge so you can eventually cross it and have a real connection with the other person. And so that's what I would say is um, if there's something that you don't, you don't completely understand about someone, um, start bridging, start, start being vulnerable and tell them that you don't understand it and say it in a way, again, that's very pure and, and, and vulnerable. Um, one example I have is that I recently got a new client and they shared something personal about themselves and I won't say what that is, uh, but it was something that made me uncomfortable and it's something I haven't had a lot of experience with. And it was something that, um, that I was even questioning, should they be sharing that? And, and so what, what I've done is I, through that relationship and, and through our, our meetings, I've said, I've, I bridged more and more. And I've said things like, okay, I don't really understand exactly how that works. Can you explain? Or, you know, what is this identity? How does this identity affect how you show up at work? Or, and I say it and again, I say it in a way that is vulnerable. I say it in a way that's pure and in a way that's inclusive. So that's how I would do it is bridging and, and trying that bridging and bringing a little bit more, more and more vulnerability into that conversation slowly. Thank you. Uh, we have 
uh, a raised hand here from Amal. Amal, do you want to ask a question? Hi, how are you? Thank you so much. I know I came late, but uh, it was wonderful to hear from you and learn from you. I have a question. As a coach, sometimes with your clients, confused about the role of consultant and the role of coaching. And uh, what's the best way uh, when you have it, uh, this kind of conversation uh, during the coaching? Uh, you think that the question is more to consultant than as a coach um, role? Thank you. Yeah, I'm also what what question I can I can I clarify this a little bit? So yeah, what's your way? For me, I will um, uh, what I do usually I will uh, step back and explain for him uh, if I will answer this. This is like a consultant's role, not like as a oh coach. yeah. You know yeah. when you have that during your coaching. Uh, yeah. uh, time and you think that what he is asking or what he is would like is more consultants yes and what's yes. the best way uh, to to uh, in that uh, time yeah. as a coach you will do for your clients yeah so so early in my coaching career i read a book called adaptive coaching because there were coach coaching truthers that said that there's only one way to coach and that you can never advise and so mm -hmm. I, I kind of, in executive coaching, I find myself balancing that a bit. Um, when someone asks me something and it's, it's not in, in my coach realm, I say, to the, I say that to them. I say, hey, um, this is more, I'm putting, this is, this is going to force me to put my advising hat on. If you're okay with that, that's fine. If that's how you want to spend your time, I can, I can give you some advice here. But I want you to know that that's not, that's not my role as a, as a, as a coach. And so that's what I do. And I, especially with executives, because a lot of times they hire me for not only my coaching expertise, but also my organizational experience. And so I would say that they like me to teeter that a little bit more than I would, I had anticipated when I first started. And now I've gotten comfortable with that. And again, I'll, I'll tell them, hey, this is what coaching is. And this is what advising is. You know, I, I want to be mostly coaching you because that's what we're here for. But if you need me to put my advising hat on, I will. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I have another question from Heba Latonia. Uh, mm -hmm. Question is that sometimes the poor awareness of the different culture of the client causes communication conflicts and being neutral doesn't help. Then how do we overcome this? Yeah, um, so with conflicts, um, and even this is people that are different from me, maybe in identities. Uh, I, again, I practice POV listening, uh, personal belonging listening. Um, usually when there is a conflict, I do more observing than anything else. Um, I will do more deeper listening, observing. And I usually ask, um, you know, what just happened, right? This is what I noticed, what, what just happened? What just happened from your perspective? And start with that question and kind of go from there. What I found is, you know, I've worked with clients all over the world and I you know I, I found that yeah, you can research what cultures are and of people, but it's sometimes it's very stereotypical. I mean, I, I do that more for high level cultural uh, differences, like in countries, I might do that. But when it comes to the person, I want to know about what makes them diverse. And that's what we want to know as a coach, like what makes them diverse? Like they may not fit into what their country's standards are. And so that's what that, that's my advice is um, P to be listening, uh, doing a lot of observing and not being afraid to dive into what's actually going on behind that conflict. Thank you, Latonia. And we have one more question from Edrigans uh, is that how would you distinguish coaching from advising? Yeah, so you 
So coaching is what it's basically um, being a guide to help people get where they want to go, right? You're, you're the guide. You're not telling them what to do. And as, as an advisor, you are telling them what to do. You're sharing your experiences with them and you're saying, okay, this is exactly what you need to do. Um, again, I, I would say the more, the more executive level my clients get, the more they want advising. It's just how it is. Again, I, when I read the book, Adaptive Coaching, that helped me a lot because I, I thought that that was like sacrilegious to, to advise while you're coaching, but in executive coaching, I found that that's actually more common than we think. So, um, so definitely um, if you're gonna, again, if you're gonna straddle, make sure that you're, you're telling your client, you're being upfront, that you're gonna put your advising hat on. And again, if that's how they wanna spend their time, fine. I mean, I have some clients and they want to spend their time just, just kind of uh, dumping some things off on me. And it, it's just, I mean, especially clients that are in marginalized groups and they're just having a hard time. And I say that to them, hey, if you, if, if you just need to get this off your chest today, just know that that's how we're going to spend our time. So is there anything else that's on your agenda that you'd like to cover? And if they say no, then that's fine. You're there as a coach to support them. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh... Latonia, and with this, though I can see there are a couple of questions, I really don't, uh, but then we are uh, you know, through with our one hour. Uh, and uh, yeah, so thank you a lot uh, for, for being there. And it was really insightful and profound uh, webinar. Uh, I, I, I personally loved it. Uh, I think maybe I, uh, I heard about this topic, but then the way you explained it, it was very beautiful and simple. Thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, our next webinar uh, would be, our guest speaker is Dr. Susie Skinner, and uh, the topic of the next webinar would be the Leader Identity Coaching, Evidence-Based Coaching Strategies and Enabling Leadership at, a, at every level. So we are going to hold this webinar at 4 p.m. GST. So please do join us, and uh, the recording of this uh, session uh, will be available on our social media handles so if you want to review it please go ahead and uh, you know and, and just kind of you know review the entire recording on any of the social media handles facebook uh, youtube anywhere so and latonia i i saw one thing there one message from somebody that uh, somebody wanted to buy your book so uh, if you can just let the audience know from where they can uh, get hold of your book that would be really helpful yeah so it's on pre order go to latoniawilkins.com and you'll see a pop-up and you can join my pre-order list via pop-up there, or you can do it on LinkedIn. Um, there's a lot of posts on there. So, but just latanywilkins.com is the easiest way. And much gratitude to everyone for joining me today. I wanna say thank you uh, from a very pure and real place. And I wanna say, we can change the world. And I really want to push us to do that. Um, there's a lot of conflict in the world right now. But there's a lot of ways that we can step up as coaches and make a huge difference. So please be on this journey with me. And I'm looking forward to connecting with all of you after this. Thank you, Latonia. Thank you once again. Uh, it was nice meeting you. And it was nice speaking with you. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.